Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a Canadian cult movie filmmaker, and I am talking about Bruce Pittman, who directed the 1987 cult classic sequel, Prom Night 2, Hello Mary Lou. He also directed um, a bunch of exploitation movies like Confidential, Mark of Cain. Uh, he directed a lot of Canadian uh, TV shows in the horror and sci-fi genre, The Twilight Zone reboot, uh, Friday the 13th, the series, and Tech War, and so forth. And I'm going to ask him about all of that. He began his career um, doing film market research at Paramount Pictures. And um, he was an apprentice for John Frankenheimer. And, wow, i got to ask him about all that stuff today and it's going to be pretty great and it's going to be an honor to talk to him so yeah here is my interview with bruce Pittman. hello hey bruce it's tommy yeah hi sorry for that i i was just in the backyard and somebody started talking to me about the uh uh stevedores and shipping industry and then suddenly i looked at my watch and said oh my god <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> that's okay it happens every once in a while but uh this is such a great honor thank you for taking the time today oh no problem at all so going back in time did you gravitate toward films early on in your childhood yes i did uh, it was the uh, the the usual uh, Saturday afternoon matinees where your parents would dump you off to get a break from you <laughs> and uh, and there was a local theater there so it was like Saturday afternoon double bills and I think when I I always sort of mark it down it was like March of 1963 and I saw Lawrence of Arabia and that really did it for me I went wow and uh, and then I started learning about, oh, directors, who directed that one? And then I started watching movies more carefully, and I started writing to film companies to get stills and stuff and collecting stuff from movies. And uh, and then when I was 16, I went to work in a movie theater as an usher and then graduated selling the tickets and running the projectors and all that. So... Yeah, I'd say from about 10 years old on, that's what I want to do is to get into the film industry in some way. Yeah, wow. And, uh, and I started, you know, 8 millimeter camera, and I started very young making films and uh, doing what I could to do that. So uh, I was sort of self-educating myself in that way, and... Uh, and then just got to meet an awful lot of filmmakers, Matt, who would give me tips and advice on how to do things. And uh, it just sort of grew from there. But, uh, yeah, I was lucky. I knew what I wanted to do from an early age and of, uh, was lucky enough never to get uh, sidelined in any other kind of work. But when I look back on it now, it's like I'm not qualified for any other line of work. So... <laughs> <laughs> so eventually I was sort of stuck with it. So is uh, Lawrence of Arabia one of your favorite movies of all time? Oh, it's still up there. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it's uh, an amazing, I think pound for pound, probably the best film ever made. Yeah. Quality of it, and when you consider uh, what they had to do, lugging 70 millimeter cameras out into the middle of the desert and getting those kind of results, it's just, amazing and uh, yeah I think David Lean is a superb director he was. Yeah, I, I, I love a lot of his films I think are just fantastic oh yeah The Bridge on the River Kwah uh, uh, yeah. Ryan's Daughter uh, no, uh, I even yeah I even like Ryan's Daughter I think it's a uh, uh, highly underrated film and uh, Passage to India uh, and even his earlier work uh Hobson's Choice. 40s. Yeah. yeah. A lot of great yeah, no, uh, Superb storyteller. Really a, a great sense of storytelling and a great sense of editing. Uh, the pace 
amazing with stories and the way he put them together and, and especially his editing because that's where he came out of was as an editor before he became a director so he knew where the camera should be and and uh, and pacing a movie mm -hmm. very good that way yeah yeah was he your biggest directorial influence uh oh there's there's almost uh too many to count. It's like if you ask me my favorite movies, it would be, uh, the, you know, I put together, you know, when you start buying movies about your desert island collection, movies you come back to often. I mean, I started with an island, now I have like a continent of movies, and it, it's all over the map. I mean, Orson mm -hmm. Welles, I think is, there's just nothing better, and I think Citizen Kane is way up on the list. Uh, uh, <laughs> one of my <clears throat> one of my early favorites was John Frankenheimer, and I think his films really stand up too. Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, uh, oh, yeah. Train, uh, you know, some really great piece of filmmaking. And uh, I did a documentary on him in 1971, and then became his apprentice on uh, a film he did, and got some. Uh, production experience seeing how things are put together yeah that's amazing uh what was he a mentor to you yeah he was he was very nice he sort of uh got me onto the production you know i said look at i just want to come and observe you you know i'm not looking you don't have to pay me and he sort of sent a letter back he said well so i should not expect to get paid <laughs> here's where we're going to be and you're more than welcome to come along and join the troops so uh, they were filming location stuff in seattle so i made my way out there and he sort of pawned me off on the uh, production manager the production office and uh, all those people sort of took me under their wing and I, I'd been doing films, so uh, being in Canada, you, you know, you, I did my own camera work, my own editing. Um, you know, I knew a little bit of everybody's job, so I became like a utility person mm -hmm. out there and ran the, the rushes, their double system uh, rushes at night, and nobody else knew how to do that, but I said, no, that's, that's easy, because I'd run a movie theater, so I knew how to do that. So I became very useful to them. Uh, you know, they'd have a day where they'd have extra crowds, so they'd have me come in as, like, fifth assistant director to handle stuff. So it was a great experience, and the people he had on his crew, of course, had a yeah. wealth of experience. So, you know, I got to know some of those people and then uh, I got a job shortly after on a program that we did up here on educational television called Saturday Night the Movies right. where we would show old films and in between uh, we would go out and collect interviews and these interviews were basically with all the filmmakers that worked on films in the 30s, 40s and 50s because those old movies were all we could afford so we were able to get interviews with, you name it, we interviewed them, cameramen, directors, uh, all, all the people from the golden era. And that became like a great education in talking to those people and, and how they did their films and how they worked. So, yeah, just that, uh, that kind of reminds yeah, me that of was great. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of uh, Mick Garris. You know, he started out hosting a cable access uh, talk show in L.A. where he was interviewing all the horror and sci-fi people, and then he ended up becoming a contemporary of them, you know, making horror films. Yeah, yeah. No, and uh, that was great. And then uh, uh, after I did that, uh, I just said, well, I'm going to just go in and do dramatic films, so I took the plunge and... Uh, uh, it took a few years to get established, for, you know, going from television and documentary and doing dramatic films is, uh, that's a big switchover because everybody wants to pigeonhole you, you know, that, that yeah. you do, you do this, you don't do that. And so, so it took a few years uh, to get that established, but it, it worked out well. I was very persistent and, uh, you know, it took, uh, I think, six or seven years before I really uh, could make a living at it, but, uh, you 
know, I always got by, and uh, yeah. Yeah, d- didn't you work in um, film market research at Paramount? Yes, I did. I got a job in 1968 with uh, Famous Players, which was the largest theater chain in Canada in their publicity department. And uh, and then uh, they were basically owned by Paramount Pictures. And then Gulf and Western came in, so it was part of that big conglomerate, although they were, I think, officially a separate Canadian company. But Paramount wanted to set up they had this idea of doing uh, market research, uh, putting all the numbers, uh, you know, people's opinions and crunching the numbers on what people really wanted to see and running it through a computer uh, to determine uh, what the public really wanted to see. I was in there not to do that because I thought that was a, a, a bad idea. Uh, but I joined the company to do the, I sold them on the idea of with all these film courses and stuff coming up that we should uh, look into that as uh, and support film courses and supply them with information. So I was sort of an offshoot of that. But as a result of them doing that, and I didn't think the company would last long that it didn't, it was called Communicon. And, uh, you know, uh, it's all that they said, well, musicals are big and action stars are big, so we'll put Lee Marvin, Clint Eastwood in a musical <laughs> in your wagon. Yeah. You know, that, you know, that's sort of how that comes out. So, uh, but uh, one of the nice results for me is I, I got to go to Los Angeles and I did a a lot of interviews with people and met some people that were uh, very good that I kept in touch with, one being Haskell Wexler. Uh, and I got up to the San Francisco Film Festival in 1969, and I met Wexler there, and he said, well, uh, I'm going to dinner tonight. There's some people there you'd be interested in meeting. And it was this group of filmmakers that had moved out of L.A. and had set up shop in San Francisco, and it was George Lucas, John Milius, Franz Ford Coppola, and this is before, you know, 69, way before The Godfather or Star Wars or anything like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it was just interesting hanging around with those people, and everybody was keen to make movies and a lot of great ideas and energetic people. That, that was really nice, nice memory. Oh, that's great. And then, <clears throat> and then you were um, John Badham's production assistant on Reflections of Murder. Yes. Uh, when I was working with Frankenheimer, uh, I mean, he's off directing, so he put me in the production office, and I got to know the production manager there, Don Kloon, uh, who was a really nice guy, and, uh, and, you know, he'd been around the business a long time, and his father had been production manager on Gone with the Wind. So uh, he got a job doing a TV movie, Reflection of Murder, which uh, John Badham was directing, again, back in Seattle. So he called me up and said, would you like to work on that? And of course I said, yes. So, uh, and uh, that was a very interesting experience too. Good film, and I thought, boy, this John Badham, he's a really good director, because it, it was a TV movie, the budget's low, you know, so mm-hmm. you have to move quickly and get a lot done each day. and. Uh, and it had a great cast, Joan Hackett, Tuesday Weldon, Sam Waterston, and it was a remake of uh, uh, Diabolique. Mm-hmm. So that was a, that was a good project. Yeah. I, I appear in that uh, film. Uh, um, I did a stunt when uh, Tuesday Weldon and Joan Hackett are dumping Sam Waterston's body in the swimming pool. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's my body they're dumping in the pool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's There's a- another shot there where a naked corpse uh, washes ashore. Uh-huh. That's my body. <laughs> I, was the uti- I was the utility corpse in that in that film. <laughs> if I ever see that, I'm gonna know it's you. <laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, see, it's just one quick shot. It's a wide shot of uh, I'm in a basket, and they dump it, and 
uh, there I am, I'm on screen for like 1.2 seconds, and then I think I'm in there a little longer with the body washing ashore. But. <laughs> That's so great. So what's the... Yeah, so now I can say I've done a little bit of something. I, you know, I've done stunt work. Oh, sure, I've done stunt work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's the genesis of Confidential? Uh, Confidential was, uh, I think it was around 74 or 75, and I just sat down. I thought I'd like to write a thing. I always loved film, film noir in that period in the 40s. And uh, I just doodled off a, a script that nobody was interested in. And then in 1983, 84, uh, there was a producer who was just a wonderful guy, a real character, Tony Kramreiter, who did really low-budget exploitation films. And he had a script from a play called Mark of Cain. And I'd been pastoring, I was pastoring every producer in town, hire me, hire me. Anyway, showed me the script, I thought, boy, this is pretty good. And, the, you know, he had budgets like, uh, I think, $200,000 tops to do the whole film. And it was like really low budget stuff. So I did the film Mark of Cain for him. Uh, and this was when you could do, and there were quite a few of them, direct-to-video movies. Yeah. Uh, there was a market for those, and he could, and he was a good salesman. He get out and sell these, get advanced sales, and so forth. As long as the budgets were low, you could make a living off it. And then he said, "Boy, that turned out well. Uh, uh, let's do another one." I said, "Oh, I have a script. Let's do that." And of course, it was a period film. He said, "Oh, for God's sakes, why make it period?" I said, "Ah, it's just gonna look better. It's got a, it's got that feel to it." And he went along with that, which cost him some extra money. And uh, so we went ahead and did it again, very low budget, uh, scaled down crew, and uh, I thought we pulled it off not too badly. Uh, I like it. It's it's not a it's not a widely seen film, but. Uh, I've always quite liked it, and it, it got a lot of very good press in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but more or less ignored over here, which most of those films that went straight to video are, you know. Yeah. You know, I see good reviews for Mark of Cain and, and that, and uh, Confidential's just uh, never did catch on except some real good reviews and a couple of prizes out of, uh, out of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, what was August Schellenberg like to work with? Oh, one of my favorite. I'd done a film with an actor, and uh, one of the first actors I worked with, and and he knew a lot of people. I said, who's the best actor you've ever worked with? He said, Barna and August Schellenberg. And uh, as it turns out, uh, there was a short film uh, Atlantis Films was doing some anthology, half-hour anthology things based on Canadian short stories, really good short stories. And there was one they had, uh, which was called The Painted Door. Mm -hmm. And I just called up Augie Schellenberg, and he came by, and I said, uh, would you do this movie for us? And he thought he was coming in for an audition, and he was so pleased. <laughs> that somebody actually said, the job is yours, we'd love you to take it. He said that it never happened to him, ever. And he was <laughs> so grateful. So, so we got on fine, and that film ended up getting an Oscar nomination for Best Live Action Short, uh, which was, uh, that was very nice. And then Augie and I, he did Mark of Cain, he did Confidential, when I started doing TV episodics, uh, whenever there was a chance to hire Augie, I would do it. Uh, and actually, the last film he did was uh, my film. Uh, he was living in Dallas, and I said, uh, would you do this for me? And this was like uh, basically a homemade feature film that I wanted to put together. Uh, and I just said, it's only for those that really want to do this film because they'd love to do it. 
I've got no fees. I can't pay anybody. Everybody gets paid the same, nothing, including me. And Augie was nice enough to say, sure. And I said, well, it's very simple. Uh, you're going to be play the producer of this film, that is a remake, and you're only seen uh, via uh, the, the Internet. Uh, so we only see your face not on a computer screen where you come in and create problems for everybody. So he said, sure. So I went down to Dallas, stayed at his house. We went into his den. I set up a, a camera. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, he read the script to me and I read it back. I played the other part and so forth. He put up with me because I'm not an actor. And <laughs> we shot it in about 20 minutes flat. His whole part was done in 20 minutes, and then we went out and had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's the last, the last film he ever did. He was, uh, he was quite ill at the time, but he was a, a terrific guy and a wonderful actor. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, even the next year, he uh, still had enough strength to go to Ottawa and play King Lear at the National Arts Center. And I went up there to see him in that. And that was uh, really the last time I saw him was uh, oh. we went out for some drinks afterwards. But yeah, really one of the really fine actors and a great guy. And he was in uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, played Setting Bull in that. And was mm -hmm. superb actor. I think he got an Emmy nomination for that. Yeah, he did voices for the cartoon movie Heavy Metal. That's what I remember most from him. Oh, yeah. Oh, and he, I guess his most famous thing was he was in the uh, Free Willy movies. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about and that. It was funny because uh, I had a place in San Antonio, Texas for a while, and he was living in Dallas, so he'd come down to visit. Mm -hmm. And we'd go to a restaurant, and uh, people would come over and, you know, whatever his character's name was from, from that movie, and he'd... Mm -hmm signing autographs which delighted him oh that's very nice <laughs> but yeah he got recognized uh, for that which is uh, yeah I mean he was quite happy about appearing in it mostly because he made a lot of money doing it mm -hmm. and then I don't he, think he ever considered one of his finest roles yeah and then you did Mark of Cain mm-hmm mm -hmm. how was that uh, production uh, that was good. That was with, uh, as I mentioned, with Tony Kramreiter, and that's the first time I worked with him, and it was uh, uh, low budget. It was freezing cold. That's what I remember most about that movie. It was uncommonly cold, and we, you know, we had to keep the cameras warm to, <laughs> to shoot night exteriors there. But we had uh, gathered together a pretty good cast, and it was from a play, and we opened it up a little, not a lot, uh, a little, and it was a good, uh, a good thriller. Uh, and I got some very good reviews, but again, you know, when you do a movie that goes straight to video, it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't get noticed that much. Uh, yeah. And uh, and the producer was happy with it. I think he made some money off it, and uh, and from there we went on to do Confidential together. Yeah. What was uh, Wendy Crewson like to work with? Oh, she was wonderful. Um, and, and it's just terrific. I mean, everybody in that was, uh, I mean, real troopers because it was, uh, this is not a film where you have a Winnebago, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and everybody was a real trooper and put up with, a, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of stuff and, uh. Yeah, and the, the cast very good, but she was she was wonderful. We got along fine, and she was easy to work with, and a really good actress. And I didn't know her that uh, well before. Uh, it had been pointed out to me that, oh, get Wendy Cruz. So that was sort of my introduction to her, but wonderful actress and still very, very active in doing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a really good actress. That's why uh, I was asking about her. How how does um, Prom Night 2, Hello, Mary Lou, come into your life? Uh, that was just after I'd finished Confidential. And uh, 
One of the producers on uh, Mark of Cain was Ray Sager. Uh, and then he went to work for Simcom, which was Peter Simpson's company. And I'm, I'm not certain, but I'm pretty sure he said to Peter Simpson, you should get this Pittman guy because he understands how to do things uh, on low budget and so forth. And Simcom at that time was involved in, uh, we had a, a, an era where there was uh, Canadian tax credits where somebody investing could get in a movie could get 100% tax write-off. So a lot of people, lawyers, accountants, and so forth, uh, and people on the fringes got into the film business to do that. And what Peter Simpson, who was very smart, very shrewd guy, arranged was to do, finance three movies uh, of moderate budget uh, in the hopes that one out of the three would make money and cover the cost of the other two. Hopefully all three would make money, but he was shrewd enough to know that's probably not going to happen. So he had three scripts, and he sent the three scripts to me, one of which was The Haunting of Hamilton High. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I thought was, boy, this script's really very good. It was, uh, it moved along. It had a sense of humor about it. Uh, mm -hmm. and was, uh, I just thought it was a great story. And I said, this is the one I want to do, which I think surprised them. But they said, sure. Yeah. Okay. You're on. And as I say, it was called the haunting of Hamel and I, nothing whatsoever to do with prom night, which they'd done before, which it made a lot of money, which it, it which then attracted investors to get these, uh, package of three films going. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think they also got some tax benefits or a partner, maybe a partner at Alarcom, I think was a company, a TV outfit in Edmonton. And the provision was that, well, we'll put up some money for you, uh, probably considerable amount of money, if you shoot it in Edmonton, right. which was fine. I mean, you know, it, it didn't really matter where you shot the film. I'm sure, you know, we said, well, Edmonton's probably got a high school, and blah, 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 which they did. And uh, and also, the only worry there was, would they have uh, enough talent? Because obviously, uh, going from moving from Toronto to Edmonton, you got to put up the crew, and how many casts are you going to take with them? It'd be better if we can cast a number of parts in Edmonton. As it turned out, there was quite a talent pool in Edmonton, and we had no problem at all about uh, getting some of the supporting players in Edmonton. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's sort of how it came about. But I think Ray Sager's the guy that introduced me to Peter Simpson and uh, and and got me the job there. Mm -hmm. Did you, Did you like the original? I've never seen the original Prom Night. Really. Yeah, and there was. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, a slasher movie affectionate or fan. I mean, I mm -hmm. just. And there was no reason for me to see it because our film had nothing to do with Prom Night. It was uh, mm -hmm. called The Haunting of Hamilton High. So, I mean, it was never mentioned to me here, take a look at this film. This is the way we want you to do it. They just sort of said, What do you think? And I said, Well, I'd love to do it. I think I can do a good job with this. So. And to this day, I've never seen Prom Night, or the original Prom Night, and I haven't seen any of the other Prom Nights. Um, yeah. So the only one I've seen is Prom Night 2, the one I did. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that, that's interesting because, you know, a lot a lot of guys who direct um, a sequel to a, to a popular movie, they do it with the motivation of um, Im improving on the original because they thought the original was so bad, you know? But uh, mm. that's that's interesting that you had never seen it. Yeah, it, it's funny because I, I've, I've read comments online and I agree that, you know, um, if, if, they, if there was to be a remake of uh, Stephen King's Carrie, that like this movie would be the perfect remake of it. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, it was. It, it's interesting because a lot of the reviews, when uh, you know, it was probably a smart idea. Uh, Peter Simpson, when he, when the film was finished, uh, you know, he took it around, uh, especially for American distributors who wants to buy this, and he got, in a, and it was well liked by distributors. So. There was a bit of a bidding war, which uh, Samuel Goldwyn Company won, so they got to distribute it in the States. And somewhere in all of that, I think there was a decision made, oh, we'll call this prom night, Hello Mary Lou, Prom Night 2, as though it were a sequel. Uh, And I don't know how that decision, whether it was Peter or whether Samuel Goldwyn came in and did that. I'm not sure when that decision was made. Uh... But anyway, they did that. They called it a sequel, which it, of course, is not. And it was funny, uh, all the reviewers, I mean, their first paragraph in it was saying, this is not a sequel, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite true. It's called The Haunting of Hamel and I had nothing whatsoever to do with the first one. There's no characters. There's nothing. It just happens to be uh, there's a prom dance in it and it's teenagers that's the only uh, thing that's that i understand is about the same with it so uh right yeah it was very funny but a lot of reviewers and they said as the sequels go this is not very good because it's not a sequel so it sort of got <laughs> knocked uh because it wasn't a true sequel well i don't blame them because it wasn't Hmm. yeah um, where, so so, where did you find um, Lisa uh, Schrage to play Mary Lou? Well, we did we did a lot of casts again in Toronto, and we saw uh, we saw a lot of people uh, for all the roles there for uh, uh, that we were doing. And Lisa was one of the people who came in and thought she was just a she was spectacular looking, and she also had a kind of a fifties look to her. Yeah. Um, we thought, you put a 50s hairdo on her, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it just, we just said, she's the one. And it's not a big part. Um, yeah. you know, she shows up a lot in the movie, but it's not a huge role. I mean, the main role was for uh, uh, for the, uh, our Lika, Vicky Carpenter was uh, sort of the lead. And we spent a lot of time in poor Wendy, uh, I thought she was perfect right off the bat, but you know the the producers, especially, are worried is the girl right, and they had her come in about three or four times, and I kept saying, "Well, you can see as many as you want, but this girl's perfect for it. Let's move on. We got a lot of casting to do here." And uh, anyway, they uh, finally said, "No, this is uh, she's the one." I was very happy. I think she did a, a really good job. And Lisa, too. I, I thought the cast turned out really good. I don't think there's any weak links. Uh, Michael Ironside uh, came in because uh, they wanted to have a name. Yeah. But if you bring in a star name in Canada at that time, you'd lose points and tax advantage if it's an American. Yeah. So Michael Ironside already had a name in that genre, and he had a bit of a box office name, and he's Canadian, so he was the perfect guy for it. And Michael, uh, he's a very fine actor. Yeah. And I think he liked this as well because he wasn't playing the deranged maniac. Mm-hmm. And he was the high school principal, and I think he quite liked that idea, and he was wonderful. Uh, good actor and the other thing I liked about him was he knew how to drive a car and hit a mark (laughs) we had one where the cameras set up and we're right out front of the high school it was a night shot I think this is still in the movie I'm not sure I do remember shooting it though and he's got to drive up and hit an exact mark so we're looking to the passenger side of the window across at him at the front door of the high school so he had about a a one foot margin and he's got to pull up fairly quickly and hit that mark and he did it on take one i mean he knew what he was doing so yeah you could kiss a guy like that who's you're not going to be fooling around all night with a sort of a a non-acting shot but 
you want it to get in there, uh, and uh, you don't want to fool around doing five or six takes of that. But he hit it on take one, and we could move along and do some of the acting scenes. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy. Quite like, quite enjoyed working with Michael. Yeah, Terry Hawks is very talented too. Oh, she was terrific. Uh, as I say, everybody in it was was great, and uh, and I'd always wished after that that I could have worked with Terry Hawks again. She was a really nice lady, and uh, and I'm sure she still is, but never did get another chance to work with her. Uh, yeah. But she had a quite a distinctive. Uh, look, and I quite like Beth Gondek, who played Jesse. I believe the character Jesse in the film. Yeah, wasn't it for long? I think she's one of the first ones to get killed, gets uh, tossed through the window. Uh, she did that scene where she she uh, says she's pregnant in the bathroom there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful scene, and she's just superb in that. Good actress, and I worked with her on on our little micro film we did about eight years ago, the one with Augie Schellenberg that I mentioned. She uh, came back and played that part mm -hmm. in that movie. Now, the the famous scene where the uh, art room teacher is being dragged by the curtains around her neck with the uh, wind blowing. It's a very very that's, very effective that's scene. Bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's. That's, That's Beth, and what they did when they when they finished the film, uh, and it, we were on a very limited schedule and a limited budget. But when they finished the film off, there was one thing that both uh, Ron Oliver and I, we and and Peter, we could never the ending that we originally had never seemed mm, it was weak. Mm -hmm. And we did film an ending, but I don't think anyone was very happy with it. And uh, and very early on in the editing, uh, what they wanted to do was, uh, uh, what Peter wanted to do was, he's a producer, that what he really wanted to do was direct. Mm -hmm. So they basically got rid of me and then did some additional shooting, uh, which... Peter, in a letter, referred to it as reshoots. Well, they didn't do any reshoots. They didn't do any reshooting of stuff I shot. What they did was additional stuff. And I noticed when I finally went in and saw the finished film that they had the time and the budget to do what we originally wanted to do was uh, the little section where she's dragged to the door with a scarf. Mm -hmm. And they did the little extra bit where she's hanging and the camera's looking down at her. Yeah. Which was part of the... So they, they supplemented what we had, which was very effective. Plus, they uh, wrote and shot a new ending, which was very good, which obviously leads to all the sequels, because, oh, there he goes, there's going to be a further adventure. You knew that was going to come up. So I thought the ending was, uh, it was kind of, it had the same tongue-in-cheek quality and was very effective. So uh, I'd say about... 90% of the film is mine, and then they had these additional shoots, which were, uh, which I would imagine be around 10% of the film they, they did later on. I think they did another two weeks of additional shooting mm -hmm. uh, to supplement it, which I think made the film better. I mean, it was very entertaining, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a great movie, I think. Then um, you started directing um, a lot of horror anthology shows like the Twilight Zone revival. Yeah, there was a few of those that came up. There was one I wish I'd done, but I never get, did get to do. Was uh, They were shooting Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and I never did get a chance to do that one, but I did do a Twilight Zone, and it was an episode which was from an original Rod Serling script that was never done mm -hmm. in this original series. So I was quite pleased to have directed a Rod Serling script. And that was great fun uh, to do. And uh, with some of the others, Forever Night uh, did an episode of that. For the uh, Friday the 13th series? Friday the 13th, I think I did at least a couple of those. Yep. And I still keep in touch with uh, the lead 
actor in that who's, oh my God, his name escapes me at the moment, but the young boy was in that. I'm, I'm his Facebook friend. So <laughs> still keep in touch. Did they ever ask you to do The Hitchhiker? Uh, no, that one was done out in Vancouver. A friend of mine was a DOP on that, but uh, no, I never got on to that one because I don't think they wanted to fly directors out oh, from okay. Toronto to do that one. So I think that was an all Vancouver shoot. And uh, I also, there's and the. That would have been in. Oh, go ahead. No, that would have been interesting to do. I think it was a pretty good series. Yeah, it was a, a great one. I've interviewed a lot of people who were on there. You also did uh, some episodes of Tech War. How was that? Um, that was very good. There were two series, and uh, they were both produced by Hans Beimler, mm. who was, in terms of TV, by far the best producer I've ever worked with and had a great sense of how those shows could be put together. And when you work on episodic, you basically, you've got a week's prep, a week shoot, and then a week to put together your cut, and then you're off the show. And Hans was a very hands-on director, not on the floor. He wouldn't come down to the floor, but in the week's prep, he would make sure that uh, there'd be a, a script reading with all the cast and very carefully, and make sure that his intentions were known to you before you went on the floor to do it. Yeah. When you're on the floor, I mean, you do it in your own style, in your own way, and you have complete freedom. And then uh, you deliver your cut, and then he would go in and and he would go through and put his editorial uh, touch into it. And he was by far and away, I mean, when he finished the two episodes, I did two or three episodes, he vastly improved them just through his editorial choices. Uh, and he was just fabulous. And he did Beyond Reality, and I think I may have done, I don't know, I did a few of those, and we got on quite well. And then he got uh, Tech War, which was, I think, based on a William Shatner uh, story. Yes, it's a William Shatner oh, show. Yeah, and I think William Shatner was executive producer, and he would show up occasionally, and he'd show up for a day and shoot his parts in like four or five episodes, his sort of guest appearances. Mm -hmm. I remember one day I, I was on one episode and said, well, William Shatner's going to come in, and he's going to do these three short little bits, but they're, they weren't in my episode. And they were very brief. It was like, uh, I remember one, he was just getting on an elevator and he turned around and he said some dialogue. I'm not even sure who he was talking to. Uh, but he, he did some dialogue and that was sort of it. And he sort of came in in a rush. We had the shot set up. He got, and I just said action. He'd go into the elevator, he turned, set his whatever it was, three or four lines, and then before I could say cut, he'd say, well, hang on. And he, we kept rolling. And he did it about three or four times, each one good, each one a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I said cut, and he said, well, one of the three of those will be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and he was out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he, he, at one point, sat me down. It may have been before we shot stuff. And Mr. Shatner would like to see you. And I said, oh, great, I'd love to see him. So we sat down and he said, you know, I always like to meet, meet the, and he referred to me as, uh, he referred to it as my directors. Well, fine, I guess I am. He's exact producer. That I always like to meet my directors. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, good. And there was this huge, long pause. Like, he didn't say anything, and it was like 20 seconds of silence. And I just said, I, I loved your work in Judgment in Nuremberg. And he launched into great stories about Spencer Tracy and Burt Lancaster. And it was great. I quite enjoyed the conversation, but I wasn't quite sure why we were having it. 
But yeah, he was a great storyteller and great fun. He came in, did his stint, and left. And I don't even know what episodes the thing we shot went into. I guess it went into some episode somewhere. But yeah, it was kind of a fun day, you know. Yeah, I'm working with Captain Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> Although I never, I never told them that I've never seen an episode of Star Trek, and I've never seen any of the movies. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. <laughs> I just, uh, I just kept quiet about that. Yeah, <laughs> I just interviewed the female lead on Tech War, Natalie Radford. Do you remember oh, her? Natalie was oh, she's she did a film for me, uh, Harrison Bergeron. Uh huh. And she's just sensational. And I think she got a, a Canadian Film Award nomination for that. Uh, and she was just, I loved working with her. She was just terrific. I didn't work with her on uh, the one you're talking about, but yeah, Harrison Bergeron, and she was just fabulous. She is a very talented lady, and she's very humble about it, too. Yeah, we, we had a really good chat. I don't think she uh, really wanted to do it, though, if the pandemic wasn't going on, because I think she was bored, and she didn't have much to say about roles and stuff, but we did a lot of, like, digressing, and we got along great, you know. She was really, yeah, really nice. No, she's a wonderful actress, and I think, she was, I think she, was she in L.A. now? Or I think well, the last I talked to her, she had gone down to L.A. to see what was happening down there. Was she a, left, a, I think, in 2007, she said, and she went back to Canada, and she's an airline stewardess. Um, she does a lot of traveling as an airline stewardess, and she's had so many celebrity encounters. She's like, even though she's not in the acting business full-time, it's still there because she meets a lot of movie stars on flights and stuff. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Well, that, no, that's great. I'm sorry she's not acting anymore, but, uh, you know, acting is... She... Man, I, I don't know why anyone would buy want to be an actor because it's a real tough business. It's... And and for women, it's murder. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm sorry she's not doing it anymore. It was like uh, Lisa Thrash. I went to a horror rama in Toronto mm -hmm. uh, last fall. They wanted some people from Hello Mary Lou there, and they got in touch with me. And I was delighted to see they also got Lisa there because I hadn't seen Lisa in like thirty thirty four years or whatever it's been. Uh, and you know, sort of walk in and, you know, you're sitting at a table and they got the poster up behind and you meet and greet people or whatever, or fans. Yeah. It was very interesting. It was a very nice day. But Lisa looked exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I come in aligned and weather beaten and probably 25 pounds heavier and 30 years older and Lisa looks exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah, that, that. But, uh, yeah, it was nice seeing her again, and she'd left the business in like early '90s, and yeah, is living a, quite content, living a very happy life. I think she married a Canadian director, and they're still together. And uh, yeah, yeah, she seemed very happy. Yeah, Lisa, I heard she started doing conventions um, not too long ago before the pandemic, so she's starting to embrace the cult success of, of prom night too. But, um, yeah, Lisa, she actually, I don't know, Natalie, I mean, Natalie, uh, she does, like, maybe one movie or TV role a year as a favor to a friend who's a producer or director or something. So she's not completely out of acting, but, you know, being a stewardess takes up her time these days. Yeah, yeah. So when, um, uh, when COVID isn't going on, I mean, are you still directing or, or creating? No, it was uh, it was uh, quite a while ago. I was working on an episodic series, and I thought the TV business it, it, you know, it really deteriorated. And I was working on a show with Sue Thomas, FBI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd done about five episodes, and it was in the second season. And I I'm reading the script that I'm to do the next week. I said, well, I did this episode last year. And the assistant director said, yeah, but the, the bad guys were Italian. This one, they're whatever. But it was <laughs> essentially the same script. And the producers, although they were sort of in L.A., would, would come and go and so forth. But they'd hire their assistant that would sit 
like right over your shoulder looking at the monitors for each take mm -hmm. and then putting their two cents in. I don't even know who these people were, except that they were, I guess they were, they would go back and tell the producers what's happening on set. I, I have no idea, but it was, and I never liked using TV monitors anyway. You get a better sense of performance if you're actually watching the actors. Um, but anyway, it was, okay, you got the monitor, you're watching it, and it was, and you you find that all they really wanted was you to shoot coverage. So they insisted on shooting everything with three cameras, which kind of really undercuts the poor director of photography, because when you're shooting with a camera, two cameras shooting 90 degrees from each other, your lighting is going to be crap. I mean, you can't light something uh, that way. I mean, it, it just looks like you've got to flood everything with light so it's lit. Mm -hmm. And so you just end up giving them a pile of coverage, uh, and then they go away and you supply your edit, but then they'll come in and just recut it, and they weren't very good editors. And I watched a couple episodes I did, and you'd have a... You know, like four people sitting at a table. Yeah. And they're all talking to each other. Well, there's sort of like eye line mm -hmm. where who's talking to who? You've got to get that straight. Well, I'd see how they'd edit it, and they'd take a take where, you know, people are looking the same direction. It was like, well, who? Who's? I just found it incomprehensible when I saw it. Although, I think they show win for three seasons, so, you know, I just thought, well, I, I don't get it. This isn't, you don't need a director there, you know. You're just hosing it down with coverage, um, and there's no finesse. I just didn't think, well, you're, you're not getting the best out of me, and... And I, you know, there I am working on a show that I probably wouldn't even bother watching. So I just lost interest, and I found the new generation of craftspeople on the set, the, the camera people, and, and that the young ones coming up, mm -hmm. they were just punching a clock. Nobody was having any fun. There was no spirit behind getting this and nobody bothered reading the script although now it's even worse because they don't allow the crew to read the scripts there's some sort of paranoia about oh we'll give away a secret if you show it to the yeah crew. so there i am you come on set and people are asking you questions which if they'd read the script and had some understanding of what you're going to be shooting that day, they wouldn't ask that question. They'd already know the answer because it was in the script. Mm -hmm. I'd find a lot of time just wasted trying to explain people what the scene was when you just want to say, guys, just go read the script. It's all there. Right. But they just seem to be punching a clock. So things had changed, and I just said, the fun's gone out of it. And all anyone seems to be doing is doing it for the, not for the love of it, but for a paycheck. And I just lost interest in that. And then it was about four years later, I just talked to a number of contemporaries my age that, that had just been kind of pushed out of the industry, mostly because of age. A great DOP and that. And I just rounded up some people and said, do you want to just, go ahead and make a movie. And uh, I found all these people that were just delighted to come in, and we had the best fun ever doing this amateur movie in and around my house. Yeah. And we took about eight months to shoot it, and, you know, we'd get together on alternate Tuesdays, and it was just the best fun ever. You know, we no, didn't have to answer producers or the network, so we just could do it... Uh, uh, I said, the lunatics are going to take over the asylum on this one. So I had great fun doing it. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I just sort of left the industry. And, and if you don't keep knocking on doors and persistently selling yourself, you find your phone, your phone stops ringing. Yeah. And I didn't mind that at all. So, uh, 
I, I'm not sorry I left it. I mean, I still do my own films in the basement there. I'll get the camera out occasionally and do little documentaries. Now, just yeah. for me and my friends. Not for sale. Just just because I love making movies, but yeah. not the way they're making them now. It's all right. Uh, lawyers and accountants and it's, corporations. It's stupid, yeah. It's interested in that. Yeah, it's stupid. I can't believe the way movies are being made today. Hopefully it'll turn around. Um, I just hope, you know, greed is not here to stay in terms of in terms of movie making, in, in, at least in the independent world, you know. It's just everyone's films are going to online streaming and just they're not being seen, you know. They're going to film festivals and you're lucky if it gets picked up, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it's uh, especially in Canada. It's that way. There's a lot of uh, good Canadian films being made, but we've always had a problem here: is they don't get shown. Yeah. Because uh, American films dominate the market, so I hear about good films, but you can't, you can't find them for love nor money. I mean, I don't know how they get them financed, even. Yeah. But even in the states, I mean, every year there's some superb films made they're generally independent films and you'll look at the beginning and there'll be all those corporate logos where they've had to go get a little money from this guy and this guy and this guy so you know you see a movie like spotlight which i really thought was good or the green book which i thought was really good and you see they had to scrape together the financing uh so you have all these various corporate logos where they've cobbled together uh, enough money to make them. Uh, and uh, at least there's a few still being made. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think independent film will always be there and there's a way to do it, but it's awfully difficult. Uh, even Steven Spielberg has problems raising money. Yeah. I mean, the projects he wants to take on are big, but I, I know he had a hell of a time getting Lincoln made. Oh yeah, which is a pretty good piece of work, but it's I a think great movie. hell of a time raising money. So I figured, hey, if Steven Spielberg has problems raising money, there's a big problem. Oh yeah, I mean, I heard that Lincoln was almost an HBO movie because they just didn't think that the movie would uh, would be a sellable commodity for you know the the, the theater public, you know. But it was, yeah, no, it, I, it did well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it did did very well. So, you know, it's a. Uh, I find that because there's a, you know, as usual, uh, I've had, you know, I talked to a couple of producers, very good producers and other directors, and we always commiserate. What's the best film you you ever did? And it's usually the ones that you didn't get to make. I mean, I've done, I think I've got three or four projects that I really pushed and invested my own money and I thought this would be a terrific idea. I also thought they were commercial. Uh, maybe I'll be, but I thought, you know, there's a chance. And I went around, never could raise money, A, because I'm not a producer and I, I don't have that ability or patience uh, mm-hmm. around and, and, and raise money. I, I'm not good at it. Uh, so... And a lot of, most filmmakers tell that the best films they ever did were the ones that never got a chance to make. Right. So, uh, you know, it. Yeah, I understand the difficulty people have of, I fully understand that of trying to get something off the ground. And it's a miracle that they do uh, get made. But yeah. they are getting made, and there's a few, but there's less and less than most producers you go to or networks or studios what they want is they don't want anything original they they look to what made money six months ago yeah and they want to do the same damn thing that so we're going through that phase of uh, comic book stuff which has lasted way too long yeah eventually that'll die out and something else come come along uh but that's, if you went to try to sell something that was not in that genre, you'd have a hell of a time. You know, it's like, oh, with Spotlight, oh, we want to do a film about priests molesting children. Yeah. But does a superhero come in and correct it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm like, well, it, yeah. I, I, have, I can, 
you know, I can't imagine those poor bastards going in to pitch that as a commercial project and getting the money to do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean Holly... I'm glad they did, because I think it's a, a superbly made film, but, uh, boy, to try and raise money on that project. Yeah, I mean, historically, Hollywood has always been that way, both in the independent film world and the big studio world, that they always want to repeat, you know, the success of whatever has, has, has hit six months ago, you know. But, you know, when you were coming up, I mean, there was so much room for experiment and movies that were experimental and different could get made. But now it's just it's all corporate and it's 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 terrible. It really is. Yeah, and there were people there where you'd go to a place and there were fewer people in charge. You'd find somebody that could make the decision. Now it's all by committee. It's got to be put through committee. So you go in and you think you've got a racehorse. By the time it gets through the committee, it becomes like a humpback zebra because everyone's got a different idea of what will make money. And I mean, they're chasing the dollar. It's like, no, 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 chase the story, get a good story. And I did, when I was doing market research in that, and I did a thing and, uh, uh, and I actually, uh, a, a friend of mine way back when, late 60s, early 70s, I met this guy who was the uh, head of Paramount Canada for distribution. And we used to sit down and have long talks. And I said to him, I said, uh, yeah. you know, you're the smartest guy I've ever met in the industry because you understand a good film, you understand how it needs to be commercial. You have just a full view of it. I said, you're going to run this company someday. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, no, seriously. But when you do, I want you to remember that I'm the first one that ever told you that. So we flash forward to the 80s, and it was Frank Mancuso. <laughs> and when he was named chairman of the board of Paramount Pictures, yeah. I sent him a letter, and I said, uh, congratulations, uh, I always knew you'd do it. And uh, do you remember I was the first one to tell you? And he sent me a very nice letter, but he said, I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So when I when I managed to get an LA agent uh, and we got a an Oscar nomination for our live action short, mm -hmm. and she got very excited about it. You know, maybe I can get you a job down here. Maybe I said, okay, here's what I want you to do: call up Fran Mancuso at Paramount Pictures and say. Say to him that Bruce Pittman's in town and he wants a meeting, an hour meeting with you. He said, I can't do that. I can't call a chairman of the board of Paramount Pitch. It don't be ridiculous. Yeah. I said, just give it a try. <laughs> and she called me back and said, oh my God, you've got an hour with Frank Mancuso. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Frank and I, and we just commiserated about all the bad movies Paramount had made that year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I did, I did uh, a survey of uh, back in the early seventies. I looked at all the top box office films. Mm -hmm. uh, Variety used to publish that at the end of the year, the top grossing films of all time. And then I went down and looked at ticket prices and equated that out. So you'd have. The most important thing is how many people, not the money it made, how many people paid to go see the movie. So you'd have the dollars made, and Star Wars is way at the top, blah, 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 blah. And, and in those days, you'd go down and, and see the money made. And I did a list of the movies that most people went to a theater to see. Mm -hmm. Completely different list. Because movies in the 40s, they, it was 50 cents to get in and see. We well, can't equate that with the 70s when they're paying $5 a piece. Right. So it was like, how many people, the most important thing, how many people did you get off their butts to go to the theater to see? And then I went through and said, okay, on this list, 
what do these movies, what do they have in common? And I went down the list and I listed all their commonalities. And what it came down to, the most popular films, the ones that got the most people in the theater, the, the thing that they all shared, they were all made by one person, either the director or the producer. Mm-hmm. Person that was one person, one person's vision. They all had that in common. The other thing they had in common is they were all good stories. Right. That's all they had in common. There were musicals, there were westerns, there were... Pirate movies. It was was all over the map. Yeah. The only thing they had in common was one guy had a good story and told it properly. That's the thing that was in common. But you try and tell that to people that are in charge of spending money and say, guys, if you want to make money, have a good story and do it properly, which means don't run it by committee. Get a script, a good script that you can all agree on, and then just hire real good people and let let them alone, let them make the movie. Yeah. But you can't tell that to people, and uh, I I gave up long ago trying to convince people of that, so. Yeah. I forgot to mention, uh, really quick, uh, you also uh, did a couple episodes of the Ray Bradbury Theater, including one with Drew Barrymore. Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, I think with Drew, I did The, Sh- the Screaming Woman, mm-hmm. uh, which was good. And then they revived the series about six, six, seven years later, and I went out to again to Edmonton. And did one with uh, Richard Benjamin. Yes. Uh, forget the title of it, but uh, uh, very good time I had on both. Let's, let's, but of course, with Drew at the time, um, and she's in practice. Uh, she's in practically every shot. But of course, we're under the we were under the we shot it in Toronto, but we were under California uh, child labor laws. Mm-hmm. So it was like, well, you get her in twenty minute increments. And then she has to go school and you're whatever for 40 minutes. Then you get her back for 20 minutes. <laughs> that was a bit of a panic. But yeah. it worked out well. And she was, bar none, one of the best actresses I've ever worked with. Yeah. She was just uncanny. There's a scene in that where a very good actor, uh, Alan... Alan Scarf? Oh, Alan Scarf. Yeah. And he's standing over her, and he's very threatening looking, and he's got all the dialogue. Yeah. Shot his stuff, and then I turned the camera around on Drew, and she's mostly just reacting to what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And I talked to Drew, and she sort of nodded, and yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. And okay. Just let's go ahead and do it. She, you know, she didn't need anything from me. Sat down. We both the one take, and after it was done, I said, "Well, cut it and print it." And I turned to Alan and looked at him, and he looked at me. He said, "Yeah, I know. I just was blown out of the water." <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna reach out to Her Alan. Reaction, her reaction was dead on and when you're cutting it together was like well we're going to be on her face a lot because that reaction is is ever bit as good as your face doing all the dialogue yeah (laughs) i'm gonna reach out to alan scarf yeah she was she was great so and she's never and now she's producing been very successful and all that yeah she's never never developed into a serious actress because she, I don't know whether it's her choice or what, she never seems to go for those parts with stretchers and actress. I mean, I keep waiting. I think she's she, in her mid-40s now. She did a movie with Whoop, with Whoopi Goldberg that was a drama called Boys on the Side, and it wasn't a bad movie. It wasn't a great movie either. It was Herbert Ross's last movie before he retired and, and died. But oh, right, yeah. she's really good in it, though. Uh, she really does show dramatic uh, chops in that movie. Oh, and she did the one with Jessica Lange, too, about the uh, the Bobier sisters, uh, Grey Gardens. Yes. And she's 
very good in that as well. So, yeah, occasionally, but uh, she should have developed into a better actress because I certainly know she's got the talent for it. But, uh, yeah. um, but I guess commercially she's done okay. She had a lot of hits, like Charlie's Angels and all that stuff. Wedding Singer. Never yeah. did see, but... She, she likes doing comedy. Uh, the other episode was called Let's Play Poison with, with Richard Benjamin. That's it, yeah. Yeah, what was he like it's, to work with? Oh, he was wonderful. Well, I, I, uh, we were in Edmonton, and we had a, a... I think it was a Sunday before we started shooting anyway. He wanted to go to the uh, West Edmonton Mall, which at the time I think was the largest indoor mall in the world. or It was, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, and I'd been there when we were shooting Hello, Mary Lou. And anyway, he and I went to it. And, of course, I'm just talking to him about other stuff, which is fine with him. He didn't want to discuss the part. I mean, he knows what he's doing, but he's also a very good director. Right. So we talked about uh, My Favorite Year, which he directed with Peter O'Toole. Yeah. Which is a lovely film. Yeah, it is. And then I talked to him about Catch-22, and about the experience of doing that film. So, uh, yeah, I was just uh, prying information on good Hollywood stories and that, and he was, uh, he didn't give me any dirt. I mean, he just talked technically and what it was like every day, and on Catch-22, it was like you'd get a call sheet where, depending on the weather, they might be shooting this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene. You know, he had, there were about six choices. So when he got up in the morning, he had to know six different scenes. And then at 10 o'clock, they'd say, here's the one we're doing, and off they'd go and do it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so he had great stories. And a wonderful guy to work with, a total pro. And being a director, I thought, well, is he going to be looking at me funny? Yeah. <laughs> None of that. He was simply there as an actor and was totally directable. You know, where do you want me to come in? Where do you want me to move to? And just bang, bang, bang. And he also knew that, you know, you've got five days or whatever we had to shoot it. And uh, he was on time, knew his stuff, and was prepared to work quickly. And uh, Mm -hmm. it was wonderful. Oh, that's great. Well, Bruce, I thank you so much for coming on today. This was a lot of fun, you sharing your uh, directorial journey with me. Yeah, well, I guess you're going to do some editing on this, I suppose. I do tend to prattle on a, a fair bit. So. Oh, I, do, I don't I do edit any stories. I, I, I think that storytellers are the most wonderful uh, people in the world, and you told a lot of great stories today. No oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm, glad you're, I'm glad you're pleased, and uh, I was happy to do it. So, uh, hope, it is, uh, hope it goes well. When's it on? Um, I'm gonna upload it on right now. Is it live? N- not live. I'm gonna upload it in a little while. Okay. And we, we, well, send me an email. Let me know where I can find it. And, uh, I sure will. I sure will. Yeah, that's great. Well, a pleasure, uh, pleasure to do this for you. And uh, feel free. I've just, I've got a million stories, and <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, some of which are actually interesting. <laughs> I think there. I think your stories today were very interesting, but um, you have yourself a great day and stay safe out there. Oh, I will. I've been hibernating, so I'm a bit bored. So this helps break up the day wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruce. Have a great day. You too. Take care. And sorry, I was late picking up the phone. Oh, it's okay. It happens. <laughs> okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Bruce Pittman. Ain't he a cool dude? Ah, what a nice man. Has a lot of great stories. I enjoy talking to him. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!